Uh, good morning, church. Uh, unfortunately, we all know the drill at this point. Uh, we were unable to have service two weeks ago. Uh, we did have service this last week, uh, but this morning with the weather, we are unable to, to meet and gather uh, in person again. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still worship the Lord. Um, and so I want this service to uh, imitate our typical regular Sunday morning gatherings, uh, even though it, it is no substitute for physically being together. Um, I still want to begin by turning our attention to the word of the Lord, um, especially as we are sitting around in our living rooms. Um, there, there are a myriad of distractions that can uh, be around us, maybe even more so than if we were in the sanctuary. Um, so I'm going to do our call to worship just like normal, um, and then we're going to have a short time of worship, um, and then we are still going to hear uh, from the word of the Lord this morning. Uh, I'm going to continue on in our sermon series from the book of Jonah. So I'm going to read to you from 1 Chronicles 16, verses 8 through 11, and there's going to be some underlined portions, and even if you're by yourself or even if you're just with your spouse or with your family, um, I would just encourage you to read those underlined portions with me. I hear the word of the Lord this morning. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence. May we seek his strength and his presence this morning, um, even if we can't see or feel the presence of one another, uh, even if we are, are in our homes this morning, let, let us seek his strength and his presence, uh, and let us tell of his wondrous works, e even today. Uh, let me pray for our time. Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity to worship you, uh, even if the, the setting is, is a little different, uh, even if it is not the same we do pray that you would just remove any distractions that we might have and just turn our hearts and minds to you. Uh, and let us just be able to, even from our own living rooms, just recount your wondrous works, Father. And may we just seek your uh, presence and your strength. Um, I pray that you would just get all of the glory and the honor for uh, all of this service, from the singing to the prayers to the preaching of your word. May uh, you get the glory, and may this all just be for our good. We love you, and we say that in Christ's name. Amen.
If you have your Bibles, and you should, you have no excuse because you are in your own home, um, I would just encourage you to open them up to the book of Jonah. Uh, we are in chapter 3. Um, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 this morning. Uh, so let me give you just a moment to turn in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3, uh, and let me go ahead and pray for our time this morning. Uh, Father, again, I just ask that you would just remove any distractions that we might have, um, and I pray that you would just use this time to just illuminate uh, our hearts uh, and our souls uh, to your words and, and your wisdom. I pray that you would just reveal yourself to us through this text uh, and allow our hearts to be conformed more into the image of Christ as a result. I pray that you would just be with all of the words that I preach and that it would not be me that is speaking, Father, but rather you speaking through me. We just say that in, in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. So let me read to you from Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet forty days, and Nineveh 
shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Uh, now, I don't know uh, if you uh, have ever wondered what your pastor does in his downtime. Uh, I, you know, I think most of you probably know I'm not really into sports. Uh, I couldn't sports to save my life. Uh, but I do love reading, and I do love studying history. Uh, so when you leave your pastor alone in his office for too long, or uh, if my wife and kids are away too long, um, there are some pretty deep rabbit trails that I can go down uh, or I can go through when it comes to, to studying. Um, this week, I've been trying to study more about the city of Nineveh, uh, trying to really better understand the context of Jonah's ministry. Uh, And this may uh, put some of you to sleep. Uh, I I hope not. Uh, But man, there are some absolutely fascinating finds uh, that archaeologists have made over the years Uh, as they have looked at the ruins of Nineveh. So like most pagans, the Ninevites, they actually worshipped a variety of gods, um, but one god in particular that they seemed to gravitate a lot towards, uh, and his name has been found on a number of inscriptions throughout the city, Uh, that have been dug up by archaeologists, uh, but it's the deity named Dagon. Now, that may be a familiar name to you if you've ever read through the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, You may remember that when the Israelites stole the Ark of the Covenant, they actually placed it in a temple dedicated to Dagon. And if you remember that story, every time they came back to check on the Ark, uh, they found that that statue of Dagon uh, would have been toppled over and his face would, would just be laying prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, there's a lot of scholarly debate about Dagon, particularly about, you know, even what kind of a, a god he was. Because typically, for pagan cultures like the Philistines and the Assyrians, uh, there's usually a god for everything. Um, A god who is in charge of the harvest, a a wheat god, a grain god, a god over the weather. And, And so there's some debate as to what Dagon was actually the god of. Uh, But in the Hebrew language, the word deg actually means fish. So Dagon could actually be roughly translated to mean the fish god or the god of the fish. Now, if that's true, that Dagon was actually a fish god, uh, that would actually make a lot of sense because he was worshipped predominantly, as I said, by the Philistines, Uh, and particularly the parts of the Assyrian Empire that were kind of along those coastal areas. And and when you have a people whose livelihood depends largely on uh, hunting and selling fish, well, it makes sense that they would want to worship this god of fish, you know, a god like Dagon that that they could pray to for success. Uh, Now, I know... You know, some of you probably don't find that uh, bit of information, that revelation, quite as uh, exhilarating as me. You know, some of you would probably just rather watch a football game rather than read some dry old uh, books about what archaeology has uncovered in the 8th century BC. Uh, And that's totally fine. Uh, But I just bring this up because I want you to um, imagine for just a moment that you were an Assyrian fisherman living in Jonah's day, 
and you were out on a boat in the Mediterranean Sea, and you were just minding your own business, when all of a sudden, you, you, you look over towards the shorelines, and you just see this monstrosity of a fish, like the biggest fish that you have ever seen in your life, and it just comes up out of the water, and it just vomits a whole human being onto the shore. Now, when you row to shore to see if this man is okay, then all of a sudden this man tells you that he has a message from God. Okay, now if you are part of a, a people who worship a fish god, and, and this man that you just encountered, he, he says he's a messenger of God who has just been spit up by the biggest fish that you have ever seen, well, you're probably going to want to listen to whatever he has to say. So, so far in the book of Jonah, as we've been studying it the last few weeks, uh, Jonah has been doing practically everything possible to uh, sabotage his own ministry. I mean, he ran away from the Lord. He tried to drown himself. Um, even in the text today, you're going to see he, he continues to be very half-hearted in his actions. He, he doesn't really seem to want to succeed. Yet, every step of the way... We've also seen a God who has chosen to sovereignly use Jonah to further his will, sometimes even in spite of Jonah. It's not going to matter how uh, reluctant or uh, hesitant or half-hearted Jonah tries to be when he finally goes to Nineveh. Because we, we see even through the means of transportation that the Lord uses to get him there, the, the Lord is actually using Jonah in spite of Jonah. You know, in this struggle between a stubborn prophet and a sovereign God, the will of the sovereign God is always going to win out. In hearing rumors about this fish-swallowed prophet, uh, the people of, of Nineveh will already be primed to take Jonah's message to heart, even if his heart isn't in it. So today, uh, we are going to be talking about how the will of God is to show you the grace of God. And, and all of us, just by the fact that we are still alive, we have all received at least a taste of God's grace, just as Jonah did when the Lord miraculously uh, saved his life by sending a fish to come to his aid. But depending upon how we respond to this grace, we will ultimately end up either wasting it, like we'll see Jonah do, or we will embrace it like we see the Ninevites doing. So, so that's what we're going to talk about as we work through these five verses. We're going to see a taste of grace, a waste of grace, and hopefully our eventual embrace of God's grace. So let's start by going back to the very opening verses of this chapter Back in verse 1, where it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose, and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, you can't read those opening verses of chapter 3 without immediately being reminded of the opening verses of chapter 1. Chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and it told him, 
Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. But, of course, we know that that is exactly what Jonah didn't do. Uh, Instead of traveling a few hundred miles east, he tried to run thousands of miles west to the modern-day country of Spain, trying to flee from the Lord. He went to Tarshish. Uh, But after a terrifying storm and and nearly drowning at the bottom of the sea and spending three nights in the belly of this sea creature of some kind, uh, we see Jonah, he is back to where he started, and he is being given this command a second time. Now, many people would interpret this to mean that we must therefore worship a God who is a God of second chances. You know, Jonah failed in his first attempt, uh, but the Lord has graciously wiped his slate clean uh, and he has given him a fresh start. Uh, It's kind of like a a mulligan in golf. That first attempt just didn't count. And no matter how many times you fail the Lord, he is a God of second chances. But I am actually going to suggest something to you uh, that is different. Something that may make me seem like an Ebenezer Scrooge or a Grinch. Um, But I'm going to suggest to you that actually in contrary uh, to what many of us have been taught, uh, what what many of us have believed, uh, or so what so many people in our society believe, I want to suggest that the Bible doesn't actually teach this idea that the Lord is always a God who gives second chances. And I say that. Because of individuals in the Bible, like Lot's wife, for example. Uh, If you remember her story from Genesis 19, um, that's where the Lord rained sulfur and fire down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. I mean, they were utterly destroyed. Uh, Those towns were wiped off the map. And the only ones that were going to be rescued were Lot and his family. And even then, only if they hurried and only if they agreed not to turn back and look at the destruction and the desolation that was behind them. But, of course, we know that the Lord or that Lot's wife did turn back. She did disobey the Lord. And in response, Uh, We don't read about the Lord scolding her for her disobedience uh, and then giving her a second chance. We read that she was turned into a pillar of salt. She was killed instantly. Um, If you want another example, you can think about Uzzah in the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, He was one of the men who uh, were appointed to carry uh, and move the, the Ark of the Covenant uh, which contained the very presence of God. Uh, so he, he was told to help move it to Jerusalem. And so they, they transported it by actually putting it on an ox cart. Uh, and it was on this cart until one of those ox suddenly stumbled. And it actually looked like the Ark of the Covenant was going to fall over. Uh, so just trying to you know save it, from hitting the ground, like maybe even many of us would have done, uh, Uzzah reached out his hand and he took hold of the ark. Uh, The problem was, is that nobody was allowed to do this. Nobody had permission to touch the ark of the covenant because God himself dwelled inside and he couldn't allow himself to come in contact with another uh, sinful human being. So the Lord didn't just wag his finger at Uzzah uh, and tell him not to do it again. There was no second chance here. Instead, he was killed instantly. 
Uh, if you want another example from the New Testament, you can look at Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. Uh, they were the ones who secretly withheld a portion of proceeds of some of the land they sold, uh, and they lied about it to the apostles in the early church. And both of them died on the spot. There, there were no second chances. There were no do-overs. So, so it's very difficult to argue from Scripture that God guarantees second chances. I mean, he is holy. We are sinful. Uh, and there are just too many examples in Scripture of the Lord rightfully punishing uh, and even killing those who have violated his commands without, you know, first uh, agreeing to just look the other way and just give them a, a number of other opportunities to try again. So, so he's not a God who guarantees second chances. Uh, but before you just think that I woke up in a cranky mood this morning, let me suggest to you that he is a God who offers something better. Uh, there, there's a Christian blogger uh, by the name of uh, Aaron uh, Wilson, and uh, he, he wrote a, a, a really good analogy um, about this, a very helpful analogy. He was talking about uh, giving a kindergartner a calculus test, you know, which, of course, the kid would almost certainly fail. But he said, suppose the teacher, you know, wants to show the kid some mercy, uh, so he decides to give him a second chance. So he you know, tears up the first exam, uh, he prints off a new one, and he, he lets the kid take the test over again. You know, on the one hand, you could say, well, the teacher is being very gracious. He didn't have to print off a second exam, but he did. But on the other hand, you're bound to realize that this second chance really isn't going to do much good because he's a five-year-old and five-year-olds don't know how to do calculus. So you could give him two chances, you could give him 50 chances, you could give him 100 chances, and he's not going to be able to pass that exam on his own. You know, that's just not going to happen. And so you start to realize that a second chance, if it's the second chance at the impossible, it's really not much of a second chance. And the same is true for you and I. No, no matter how many chances the Lord could give us, we will always fail to perfectly live in obedience to God's law. We just can't do it. It's impossible. I mean, you can't go a few moments or a few minutes without having sinful thoughts and intentions, let alone trying to live your entire life that way. So, so rather than just giving us additional chances, uh, which are really just more opportunities to fail, God has given us something better instead. He has shown us grace by giving us both his son and his spirit. Now, Jesus lived a perfect life on the first try. He never needed a second chance. So if you have submitted your life to him, um, if you have died to your old self, it, it, if it is no longer you that lives, uh, but rather it is Christ that lives within you, then God the Father, he, he no longer sees your kindergarten attempts to live a perfect life. Uh, even though the Father looks down upon you from his throne, he doesn't see you and your messed up rebellious state. He, he sees Jesus's righteousness instead. But, but God doesn't just give you grace through his son. Uh, he actually even takes it a step further and he gives you his spirit as well. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead 
If he dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Uh, also, 2 Timothy 1, 7 uh, reminds us that this spirit, which has brought us to life and now dwells in us, it is not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So without the Holy Spirit, second chances wouldn't matter. Now, left to our own devices, we would never pursue God or the things of God. But through his Spirit, not only can we have life, uh, but we can be empowered to live that life in self-control and to also live a life of love and righteousness that is pleasing to the Lord. So, so Jonah was given a taste of God's grace. Uh, e even though this grace wasn't guaranteed, uh, the Lord didn't have to give him this opportunity. You know, he could have rightfully left Jonah right where he found him, right at the bottom of the sea. But even though he could have, he, he doesn't. Somehow in this display of God's mysterious and marvelous mercy, he allows Jonah this other opportunity to, to go to Assyria to, to do what he originally commanded. But... As we will see next, Jonah is going to completely and utterly waste this grace that he has just been extended. He was given just a, a taste of this grace, but, but now he is going to waste it. Even though the Lord just gave him quite literally life-saving grace through that fish that rescued him, Jonah doesn't want that grace that has just been extended to him to be extended on the inhabitants of Nineveh. So moving on to verse 3, uh, we're told that, that Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. breadth. Um, it was one of the most important cities in the ancient world. And so Jonah has this opportunity to truly make a global impact by speaking about the one true living God. He, he can speak about him to some of the most powerful and influential individuals of his day. But instead of long, eloquent, uh, persuasive sermons trying to convince the Ninevites to repent of their sins and to beg the Lord for mercy, Jonah instead calls out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's eight words in my translation of the Bible. Uh, five words in the original Hebrew. You have other prophets in the Old Testament, like Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah. They wrote lengthy, lengthy prophecies concerning other nations. Uh, but these five words are the only words of prophecy ever recorded by Jonah. And Jonah doesn't even offer any hope to the Assyrians in this prophecy either. He doesn't say, you know, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown unless they repent. You know, he doesn't say destruction is going to come unless you turn from your wickedness. No, he just says 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And whenever I envision Jonah preaching in Nineveh, um, I can't picture him excitedly, uh, with a lot of animation, calling out and trying to, to talk to everybody who passes him by on the street corners. Instead, I, I have this image of Jonah quietly, maybe almost whispering or, or just kind of mumbling these words. 
Because he doesn't really care if anyone in Nineveh hears him or not. He doesn't really care whether or not they actually repent. Which goes to show you that any outward action that doesn't stem from inward obedience, it really isn't obedience at all. Uh, outward action that doesn't stem from inward obedience really isn't true obedience. Um, I haven't mentioned this yet in our series, but the uh, name Jonah actually has a meaning in Hebrew. Uh, Jonah is the Hebrew word for dove. I mean, oftentimes in scripture, when you see a dove, it's supposed to represent the very spirit of God. And so, you know, just, yeah, you can think, you know, if you want an example of that, you just think about Jesus' baptism, where the uh, Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. Um, so this man, Jonah, his name is Dove. And he was sent to Assyria to act as an ambassador of God's spirit, to offer to them new life. Yet, the, the irony is, is that clearly God's spirit isn't at work in Jonah's own life. Because even while he utters the, the words that he's expected to, he, he still inwardly hopes that the Assyrians will continue in their wickedness. Because he doesn't actually want to see them saved. So, so Jonah was given a taste of God's grace. And we see that he did nothing but waste this opportunity. Yet, despite that, the, the story still has one kind of unexpected twist as it ends. Because even though God's own prophet doesn't embrace this grace, the pagan Assyrians will. Uh, apparently, Jonah was the world's worst and best uh, evangelist. Uh, apparently, he preached the world's uh, not just shortest sermon, but the world's greatest sermon, because 120,000 Ninevites repented as a result. And you can't really overstate what a miracle uh, this actually was. Um, I don't care what you think about the political situation in our own country, uh, but Nineveh was far, far worse. Um, I said at the beginning that archaeologists have been able to give us a variety of insight into the culture and society of Assyria. Uh, well, we actually have a royal diary that was uncovered uh, that was written by one of the Assyrian kings. Um, I, don't, I don't even know if I can pronounce this guy's name, uh, but I think it was something like Ashurnazepal II. Uh, he lived just a little before the time of Jonah. Uh, so I'm sure Jonah was well aware of the evils committed by this king. Uh, but here's a short excerpt for you. Uh, to give you a, a day in the life of a typical Assyrian king. He writes, In strife and conflict, I besieged and conquered the city. Now, I'm not even sure what city he's talking about because there were a lot of cities that this guy besieged. But he goes on to write, I felled 3,000 of their fighting men with the sword I captured many troops alive. I cut off some of their arms and hands, and I cut off uh, some of the others, you know, their noses and ears and extremities. Um, I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made one pile of the living and one pile of heads, and I hung their heads on trees around the city. So these are the kinds of people that Jonah was preaching to. These are the ones who are repenting, all of them, from the greatest to the least of them. These are the ones putting on sackcloth and fasting as signs of their repentance. This isn't like as if a you know, revival would break out across America, as miraculous as that would be. 
No, no, this is like if a revival broke out inside Al-Qaeda or among the Taliban. You know, if we suddenly heard reports of terrorists, uh, even high-ranking terrorist officials, th this is like if we heard about them turning their lives over to Christ. And that's how significant this was. And there are some of you who I am sure don't always feel as though, you know, you have the greatest confidence when it comes to sharing the gospel with others. You know, in fact, it's probably been a long time since you actually did share the gospel with someone. Maybe you're afraid of what they might say or how they might respond, um, or you just don't think that, that sharing the gospel with them is going to work. Your words aren't eloquent enough to ever make a genuine impact on the soul of someone else. Um, but I guarantee you that however you share the gospel, it doesn't take much to share God's truth more faithfully than Jonah did. I mean, if you're speaking more than five words about Christ to someone, you're already on the right track. And if Jonah's reluctant and half-hearted efforts could, could make that much of an impact so that these ancient um, 8th century terrorists would turn in repentance to the Lord, well, then just think about what kind of an impact that you could have on the lives of others if you would just willingly Go to where the Lord would call you to go and share the good news of Jesus with those he has called you to share to. I mean, just, just think about what the Lord could do through you when, when you take that taste of God's grace uh, that he has extended to all of us. And instead of just wasting it, you embrace it yourself by submitting your life to Christ and then you teach others to embrace it as well. Just think about what the Lord could use you to do to further his kingdom. Let me pray. Father, I pray that, that we would have, have tasted and just seen a, a glimpse of your uh, grace through this text today. Um, I pray that, that you would have uh, just given us life, uh, just like you gave life uh, as you rescued Jonah through this fish. I pray that, that, that we would have, have seen the life uh, that is offered through your son, through Christ who came to rescue us, Father. But I pray uh, that as we have seen a, a taste and a glimpse of this, that we would uh, not waste this grace that has been given to us, uh, but rather we would just uh, embrace it, Father. We would submit our lives to you uh, and we, we would seek to share this truth with others so that they might embrace it as well. I just ask all of this in Christ's holy uh, and precious name. Amen. Uh, let me read to you uh, a final scripture. Uh, hear this as a benediction as you go this morning. Hear the words of Paul from Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. He writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.